At this time, I'd like to uh, welcome Pastor uh, Ken Burks. Thank you. You can all be seated. I don't know how long I'll stay seated. This is usually not my comfort zone sitting in a chair, but we'll give it a try. <laughs> Amen. Hey, that was quite a breakfast, wasn't it? <laughs> I like those scalloped potatoes. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray and ask God's blessing, his anointing upon the word today. Father, we just come before your presence now and we give you all the glory. I thank you for each one of the men who are present here today, Lord, that have given up their Saturday morning to be here, to hear your word, to worship you, and just to fellowship with one another. So, Father, we just ask for your anointing, your blessing upon this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. I would have to say that over the last 20 years or so, one of the greatest lessons I have probably learned is having a real understanding that my life has been designed by God. How many believe God created you? That he is the creator and that he knows every aspect of our lives. The Bible says, I think it's in Psalms 139, he is intimately acquainted with all of our ways. And so he has designed us in such a way to work in relationship to his overall purpose. Amen? God has a purpose in the earth today that involves each and every one of us. And God's desire for us is to be in sync with him. Amen? How many know it's not good to be out of sync? When you are out of sync, things don't go right, do they? They just don't. It's like we keep short-circuiting the system. And when you short-circuit something, what happens? You have a cause and you have an effect. And usually you have to go in and rewire something after something has been short-circuited. How many know God is very good at rewiring our lives? And he, he's continually rewiring our lives because we keep short-circuiting. But I believe that God really desires for us to be in sync with his purposes. And so how's your life going? Amen? How is your life going? Do you sense that most of the time your life is in sync and operating smoothly, or is it constantly out of sync? and something going wrong constantly. <clears throat> you know, how, how many like it when, when things in your life just begin to fall apart? <laughs> it's, it's not much fun, is it? But, but sometimes it seems like we go through a series or a season in which it seems everything is broken. And I remember, oh, I don't know, it was a few years ago. It was like, I, remember, I said it to John Houghton or somebody. I says, I says, um, I probably said it to him because we both like Bob Dylan. And he has a song called Everything is Broken. <laughs> and I, I said, it seems like everything is just broken. <laughs> and that's not good. I, I believe God has designed us to operate smoothly, amen? Like a well-oiled machine. And obviously, we're going to have bumps along the way. The Bible says, if we live godly in Jesus Christ, we shall suffer tribulation. And so those things are going to come. But I believe that many of the things that we experience in our life, the hardships that we experience, are because of our own doing. There's an interesting scripture in Peter where it says, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold tribulations and things of that nature. In other words, it doesn't have to be. Your life doesn't have to be out of sync. Your life doesn't have to have everything going wrong. It can operate smoothly. And I believe that that's the way God has designed our lives for the most part. I believe if our lives are out of control, it's a good sign that we're not in sync with what he has purposed for our lives. That's an indicator. You know, in our car, we have little lights that come on that indicate that something is wrong. I believe there are things in our lives that happen 
that are indicators that something is out of sync. And a lot of times what we do in our cars, oh, that's just that dumb light coming on again. <laughs> For whatever reason, and we ignore it. And I believe that we ignore the indicators in our lives many times. God is trying to get our attention. He says, listen, something's not right here. Something's going on. You need to pay attention. You need to figure out why this indicator light is coming on. You know, I recently watched a video, I think it was on Facebook or one of those places, of this contraption that was quite complicated. Some of you may have seen it. It had all of these little balls that were just shooting out of everywhere, and each ball was designed to land in another place, in a position, a, a designated position. And once it landed in that designated position, it began to further what was happening in that contraption, and all of a sudden, all these other balls were coming out, and it was just like every ball was landing perfectly where it was supposed to land, and it was just an awesome thing. Um, it, it was designed, every ball was shooting out, designed to operate in a perfect order and perfect harmony with how the, the, the machine was designed. And I got to thinking about that, that that's the way God wants his body to operate. In perfect order with the design of how he has created it to operate. It's an awesome example of how something could function in perfect harmony according to its attend, intended purpose. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says in verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You see, this is how God has designed each one of us to operate in relationship to his purpose purpose and his will on earth. Perfect harmony in relationship to what he's doing. It says, when all the parts are doing their share, when every joint is connected, it causes edification or the building up of the body in love. How many know that that's revival right there? That's what God's after. And I don't believe we are going to see revival until we begin to operate in harmony with the way he has designed and created us to do. Otherwise, we're just <laughs> a bunch of disjointed ligaments and bones and everything else, and the flow cannot get through. You know, the flow starts out really good. The anointing, oh, there's a break. <laughs> Something's not working there, and it disrupts the flow of the whole. And so God has designed us as a body to operate in a certain way. That means none of us are a law unto ourselves, amen? We have to submit ourselves to what God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit desire for us to do. And that requires a lot. It requires death to self, amen? It really does. It requires us being alive to God and his purposes in the earth. In the book of Genesis, we have the accounts of how God began to establish and accomplish his purposes through mankind. For example, we have the account of God accomplishing his purposes through Abraham. God used Abraham as the seed for the nation of Israel. Abraham was the seed. The nation of Israel was not in existence. When Abraham came along, he was the seed that God was going to use to birth a nation. In Genesis 12, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, 
and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this is what I want you to see here, is that the focus of God's relationship was not on Abraham's walk with God. The focus was on God accomplishing his purpose through Abraham. That's the focus. That's the focus of God's relationship with each and every one of us, for him to accomplish his purpose through our lives. And how many know that <laughs> there are a lot of things in the Bible yet to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back? Amen? Every jot and tittle must be fulfilled. God has a lot of purposes for mankind. And you know who he's going to use? He's going to use you. He's going to use you. He's going to use each and every one of us to fulfill his purposes in the earth today. The focus was on God and not necessarily Abraham. Do we see that difference? The focus is on God. The focus is on Abraham. The focus is not on Ken. The focus is on God. Amen? The focus is not on you. The focus is on God. See, if the focus was on us, we would be all self-centered. <laughs> we are to be God-centered. And that's really what this message is all about, being God-centered versus self-centered. We have to be God-centered in our lives. See, I, I believe too much of the church even today is too self-centered, way too self-centered. And it's time for us to become more and more God-centered. And so today I want to talk about what it means to be in sync with God and his purposes for our lives. And what it means to have a God-centered lifestyle versus a self-centered lifestyle. And the operative word here is lifestyle. How many know that not one of us here today is perfect? Now, in God's eyes, thankfully, we are perfect. Amen? He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. See, the work of Christ is completed in your life. But the work of the Holy Spirit is still going on. He's still transforming us from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ. And so on one hand, I look to God, and he sees me in the righteousness of Jesus as this perfect specimen. <laughs> But sometimes in your eyes, I'm not so perfect, am I? <laughs> and you're not so perfect because we're still working out this great salvation. But lifestyle here is the operative word because if we are double-minded and continue to revert back to a self-centered lifestyle, our lives will continually have short circuits. We will continually be short-circuiting. Now, nobody's perfect, like I said. We're all going to short-circuit at a time. But the difference is, when someone looks at your lifestyle, what do they see? They see a person dedicated to the cause of Christ. I look at Gary here, a very God-centered person. Uh, it seems like every time I see him, he's always involved in something for the Lord, doing something. And many of you, I look at David, same thing. Um, I, 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 I really um, respect David a lot. I don't know if I've ever told him that. But I see a man who's very spiritually minded, but I also see a man who has a genuine servant's heart that, does, that is not afraid to get his hands dirty. Amen? And that's what we have to be. We have to be people who are not afraid to get our hands dirty for the Lord. Because in many of the things that we do in life, we will get our hands dirty. My wife shared a story a few weeks ago about Pastor Francis. He had picked up Kenny. He had just gotten out of the hospital. How many know who Kenny is? He's a transient. I haven't seen him around for a while. Um, but he'd picked him up, and he'd just gotten out of the hospital, and he was a mess. He was dirtied. He was soiled. <laughs> he didn't know what to do. So, you know, we just live a half a block down the street, and he stops by our house. 
<laughs> I've, got, I've got a problem on my hands. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> and so bring him in. We'll get him cleaned up. And so it was like, you know, we had other things going on that day and everything else. And, and um, But I ended up getting in the shower with him and cleaning him up and, and just, you know, Lydia and Francis and... and um, um, the guy that runs the um, clothing ministry, what's his name? But went down to the um, clothing ministry, got all new clothes for him and everything. Anyway, within half hour, 45 minutes, he was fine. He was ready to go. Um, but, you know, that's the thing. God will often interrupt our lives, amen? And if we're focused on self and what self can get out of it, we will not be available for what God's intended purpose for that moment Yes, many of us miss what God wants to do in our lives because we're too focused on self. But when we're focused on God, his purposes, his will, what he wants, what he desires, then we're ready. We're perfectly positioned to be that conduit for him. And, and I believe that if we're going to see any kind of revival, any kind of an awakening, it has to start with each and every one of us, where every one of us is doing our share, doing our part that causes increase for the whole. And it takes a lifestyle to build that. See? It has to be built into our lifestyle. Obviously, we're going to miss it on occasions. But what is your overall lifestyle say to the people around you? Do they see a self-centered person or do they see a God-centered person? Paul said, I die daily. How many like that? That doesn't sound like much fun, does it? I die daily. I have to die to myself every day of my life. When I get up in the morning, I have to speak to my soul. Soul? Guess what? You've got a job to do today, and your job is to die. <laughs> your, your job is to get with God's purposes, is to think about what God wants to do in your life, is to think about what God is doing in the people around you, doing with your family, doing with your wife, all of these things. See, when we begin to look at life like that, guess what? Life begins to happen like that. We begin to find ourselves more involved in God's purposes around us than trying to feed this self that can never be satisfied. Trying, trying to feed something that cannot be satisfied is like throwing dirt into a bottomless pit. <laughs> it never amounts to anything. It just keeps... You know, how many have ever tried to really minister to somebody that is totally absorbed in themselves? It, it's, it's ridiculous. You can't do it. It's just a waste of energy. It really is. And, and so our job then is not to only convince ourselves we need to be God-centered, but to convince others, amen, to show them that that is the way to victory, that is the way to self-fulfillment, if you want to call it that, or God-fulfillment. I, I even hesitate using the word like self-esteem. I prefer Christ-esteem. I don't, my, myself does not need to be esteemed. It needs to be conquered. <laughs> it really does. But God in Christ needs to be esteemed in my life. He needs to be esteemed. And we need to esteem Christ in others. The Bible says we should not even look on each other according to the flesh. In other words, when I look upon you, when I speak with you, or anything else, is okay. I want to see where Christ is at in your life. I don't really want to know too much about the old self, the old nature. I want to see what Christ is doing in your life and my life. And so the focus of the Bible is God. The essence of sin is a shift from a God-centered lifestyle to a self-centered lifestyle. That's what the focus of sin is. It takes your, your, your um, eyes and your gaze off of God and on to self. 
And we see this in the fall of Adam and Eve. God placed Adam and Eve in a beautiful and bountiful garden. <laughs> How many would have liked to have been in that garden where everything was beautiful, where you were an eternal being not destined to die? Adam and Eve weren't supposed to die. That was the cause and the effect of them short-circuiting what God had planned for their lives. Eve saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, so she ate it. She chose to look at self rather than God. And many times we do the same thing. We choose. It's a choice we all make. We choose to look to self rather than God. Let me, let me tell you something. I think we all know this. It doesn't take any energy to look to self. It comes natural. Because we are human beings. That's who we are. We are carnal creatures. It's the most common thing to do. It's the most natural thing to do. What is unnatural is to be spiritually minded. And that takes a little energy on your part. It takes thinking about it, meditating about it, choosing, making a choice to do what's right before God. And obviously it involves the grace and the mercy and the compassion of God and all of that. But I believe God will lead us. He will direct us into a smooth lifestyle <laughs> that doesn't have so many bumps in the road where everything is constantly being short-circuited in our lives. When we make that choice to say, okay, I'm dying today. I'm dying today. I'm giving up self. I'm not going to glorify self today. Amen? And so in Genesis 3, we see in verse 6 where the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. You see, at that point in time, there was a major short circuit in the plan God had for mankind. There was a cause and there was an effect. They were no longer in sync with God and his purposes. But thankfully, God came to them and rewired them, amen? He killed an animal, shed the blood of that animal, and covered them with the animal's skin. But now their purpose had been rewired. God's purpose had to be changed. And so that's the way, that's how we ended up the way we are. <laughs> because we all have partaken of Adam's and Eve's sin. And so what kind of effects are short-circuiting your lives? And what is the cause and the effect in your life that you're having because of self-will getting in the way? We see this in the story of Joseph and Potter's wife, the essence of salvation is a denial of self and not an affirming of self, amen? It's not to affirm self. And, and unfortunately, even in Christian circles today, there's a lot of counseling, a lot of things that are saying, you need to affirm self, you need to affirm self. No, my self does not need to be affirmed. I need to affirm Christ in me, the hope of glory, amen? Christ in me, the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit in me, the hope of glory. That's who needs to be affirmed in my life because he is the one that's going to change my life. He is the one who's going to conform me into the image of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to do it. I can't do it on my own. I can't do it by, by just, you know, thinking, okay, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. No, it's Christ in us. His work in us that makes the changes. His grace, his anointing in our lives that causes us to be who we are in Christ. And I believe every one of us needs to come to that place and say, who am I? Who am I in Christ? Not who am I in the world? 
And part of that means we give up our old identity, amen? I think one of the biggest things that holds people back from maturing in Christ is that they're unwilling to let go of that old identity that was born out of self and what self could get out of it. We have a new identity when we come to Christ. He makes all things new, amen? All things are passed away, and I'm a new creature in Christ. And as I begin to relate to who I am in Christ, not who I was, I don't even think about it. I just wrote the book about who I was. But until I wrote that book, I hadn't thought about that for years, about who I was before I came to Christ. Because I was so immersed into what God had done in my life, see? So immersed into what God was doing in my life and so immersed into what God was yet to do in my life. I'm now 64 years old, and I'm still immersed into what God is going to do next. You know why? Because he says in Philippians 1.6 that I can be confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so God is not finished with me. He's not finished with you. He continually to work, he continually to works, work on our behalf. He does. Now, if the Holy Spirit is in my life, then why am I not being conformed into his image on a daily basis? I'll tell you why. Because we have the power to quench the Holy Spirit. Every one of us has the power to quench the Holy Spirit because God will never force his will upon you. We have to yield to him. It's a yielding process. And when I die daily, that's what I'm doing. I'm yielding myself to the work of the Holy Spirit, to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know what happens? When we yield ourselves to the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the anointing will break every yoke. It will break every yoke. There is more victory in submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in your life than any other devised plan that you can come up with. That's what's going to break the yoke, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that means you have to release him. You know, I love the scripture in Colossians where Paul says, I strive mightily according to his working in my life. In other words, the Holy Spirit wants to work mightily on your behalf, amen? He wants to work mightily on your behalf. But the problem is we're dragging our feet. We're focused on self. It's like how many of you have ever been uh, on a project or something with somebody and they were, they were not into it, but they had to do their part and you had to do your part in order to get it done. You know what happens? You frustrate each other and nothing gets done. I believe what happens in the spirit realm is that we are frustrating the grace of God and he cannot move on our behalf because we are not being violent about our faith. The Bible says the violent take the kingdom by force. And so when we talk about being God-centered, it means we're being violent about this thing that God is doing in our lives, amen? And, and too many of us have this lackadaisical attitude me included. I get that way. I'm phlegmatic by nature. I don't seem very phlegmatic right now, but <laughs> I am phlegmatic by nature. But you know what? The anointing changes us. The anointing changes us. And it will change you when you give in to the anointing in your life. It will bring you into a place of being God-centered rather than self-centered. And so in the life of Joseph, we see Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife daily begged Joseph to come to bed with her. With her. 
He told her he could not do such great wickedness and sin against God. When she tried to force him, he fled the room and went to prison rather than yield to temptation. Now, don't be honest with me right now, but <laughs> I mean, a lot of us would have, <laughs> would have quickly given in to that temptation and said, well, she's making herself available to me. You know, I, I'm just human, <laughs> but not Joseph, amen? Joseph says, how can I sin against God? Joseph was God-centered. In Genesis 39, it says, now it came to pass, verse 7, after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is, within me, what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There was no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And so if we're to see God accomplish his purposes through us in the world today and bring forth revival that we all long for, there must, we, then we must come to a denial of self in the same way that Joseph did. We must have a God-centered lifestyle that glorifies God and not self. It's a lifestyle. If, if it's just something that hasn't become a lifestyle and something that you are firmly committed to, you're going to give in to whatever the emotional whim is at that moment. It's like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation such as overtaken you, but such as common to man. But with the temptation, he will make a way of escape. Do you know what your way of escape is? Do you know what your way of escape is? I don't care what it is that you struggle with. There's an answer to it in the word of God. You need to know the scriptures that you can immediately bring up that will tell you where your escape is at. You know, a lot of times it's just thinking about the consequences of where that will lead us, taking the time to think that out. And so when you're tempted, that way of escape comes up because you've already thought it out, you've already meditated on it, you've already purposed in your heart how you are going to respond, amen? You've thought about when that happens, and, and listen, everybody here today knows your temptation, knows what you are tempted by. You know it, you deal with it on a daily basis. So learn how to activate God's escape plan, amen? Joseph knew what to do because he had a lifestyle of knowing what to do. And that's why we have to develop a lifestyle of what to do when the enemy comes to us, amen? Think about this. What would have happened to the purposes of God in the world today if Joseph would have given in to temptation? The nation of Israel came about because of Joseph. The nation of Israel was still being formed through Joseph and his brothers. It was because of Joseph that they came to Egypt and were put in the land of Goshen where they were formed and then released. What would have happened if Joseph would have been self-centered and not God-centered? I'm sure God would have figured something out because he's God, amen? But do you see how our lives are intertwined with God's purposes? And so many of us proclaim ignorance instead of embracing that I am a child of God. I am a son of God. I am one of God's anointed ones. I am the one that he loves. I am the one that he wants to use in this situation. Rather than saying, oh, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will come by. I mean, how, how many times, and I've done it too, driven by somebody stranded on the side of the road and thinking, oh, somebody else will take care of them. Oh, they got a cell phone. They don't need any help. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. 
but we have everyday life situations that come up, and most of us don't even see them or notice them. Why? Because we're too focused on self. We're not aware of what God is doing. And, and I, I believe that by being God-centered, God wants to increase our awareness of what's going on around us in our field of labor. And so the nation of Israel was birthed out of Joseph's obedience. Just as God accomplished his purpose through Abraham and used him as a seed for the nation of Israel, he accomplished his purpose in bringing that seed to fruition through Joseph's obedience. Just as the focus of God's relationship was not on Abraham's walk with God, but rather God accomplishing his purpose through Abraham, the same was true for Joseph. The focus was on God, not necessarily on Abraham or Joseph. Now, we're living in an era where the final culmination of all plans and purposes of God is at hand. God is looking for men and women like Abraham and Joseph who will be conduits for his purpose to fill the earth with the fullness of him. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says before Jesus comes, he's going to fill the earth with the fullness of his presence. We're going to have a body that's going to stand up and be the body of Christ in the stature and the fullness of Jesus Christ. Just as Christ ministered on earth, I'm not going to go into this too deep, but just as Christ himself ministered on earth for three and a half years, I believe the body of Christ is going to stand up like that verse in Ezekiel 37 where God blows on the bones and they stand up as a mighty army in the earth today. That's God's purpose yet to be fulfilled. Will we be a part of that? Here's the deal. The Bible says all things are lawful or permissible, but not all things are beneficial and constructive. I believe much of today's Christianity is too focused on what is permissible and lawful versus what is beneficial and constructive. If we truly desire revival, I believe we have to desire to live in the beneficial realm of God's grace. There's a permissible realm. I'll give you that. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. What purposes does God want to give birth to in your life that relates to his overall purpose and will here on the earth before the coming of the great day of the Lord? Oh, we may not lose our salvation over our fleshly desires, but we will definitely miss out on what God wants to do in and through us in our relationship to him and his purposes and the destiny that he has for each and every one of us. Let me give you some God-centered traits and some self-centered traits. We'll look at the self-centered traits, and I'll go quickly here. Self-centered traits, life is focused on self. Proud of self and self's accomplishments. We all fall into that, don't we? Every one of us. Self-confidence. What is self-confidence? Confidence in self? <laughs> I don't want any confidence in myself. Dependence on self and your own abilities. How many know that God has divine abilities he wants to give us? But if we're just focused on our carnal abilities and our own abilities, we will miss out on those divine abilities. What I'm doing here today is a divine ability I never knew I could ever have at one point. I was the most shy and timid person in high school, I was painfully shy. Try to get me to speak. I wouldn't even take a speech class. You know, 
it was it was just out of the question. But once the fire of the Holy Spirit gets into our lives, he really changes and conforms us and, and causes us to be something that is beyond that natural person, amen? And he wants to do that in every one of our lives. He wants to give you divine abilities. The Bible says that his power is great towards us who believe, amen? Great towards us. Every one of us has an anointing, as it says in 1 John. We're, we're self-centered traits again, affirming self, seeking to be acceptable to the world and his ways. The church is caught up in this. We're trying to copy the world today. Romans 12 says, don't copy the world. God has a better plan for us than to simply copy the world and its ways. Seeking to be acceptable in the world, looking at your circumstances from a human perspective, or just selfish, ordinary living. That's where most of us are at, is just selfish, ordinary living. So self-centeredness is really a subtle trap. It makes sense, humanly speaking. You can avoid it at one time and fall right back into the trap at another time. God-centered living requires a daily death to self and submission to God. Here's a God-centered trait. Confidence in God. See, <laughs> let me tell you something. Unless you get to know God, you won't have confidence in him. Unless you get to know God's ways, unless you get to know his word, you won't have confidence in him. One of the problems with today's Christianity is, is that most Christians are Bible illiterate. We cannot afford to be Bible illiterate. We need to know the word of God because it's in the word of God we begin to develop our, our confidence in him as the Holy Spirit instructs us. The word and the spirit are desiring to partner together in your life to bring you into a deeper realm of confidence in him. It's dependence on God and his ability and provision. See, a lot of us, we, we, we devise our own plans of how to take care of our lives because we don't have the confidence in God's ability to provide for us. And when we have the ability to just trust God that he's not gonna leave us out there hanging and we just really put our life and invest our life in his, his ability towards us in that way, he becomes Jehovah Jireh to us, amen? The Lord, our provider, he will provide for us. If you're short-circuiting in that area, you need to question why, you really do. In any of these areas, you need to ask yourself, am I short-circuiting here and how do I need to get rewired by God? It's the life focused on God and his activity. It's being humble before God. It's denying self. It's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's seeking God's perspective in every circumstance. Holy and godly living. Holy and godly living. Was Joseph involved in holy and godly living. Amen. Are you involved in holy and godly living? Or do you just say the grace of God will cover that? And God's grace probably will cover it. But in the process, you'll end up frustrating his grace to set you free. Amen. Again, keep in mind, none of us are perfect. None of us live here all the time. You know, we all revert back time and time again. But it's our overall lifestyle that counts. The question is, is your lifestyle based on God-centered traits or self-centered traits? To live a God-centered life, we must focus our lives on God's purpose and not our own plans. When God starts to do something in the world, he takes the initiative to come and talk to somebody. For some divine reason, he's chosen to involve his people in accomplishing his purposes. How much easier would it have been for God to just say, hey, I'll just do it? <laughs> well, we wouldn't have choice, would we? There's a lot of things that I believe God, you know, who, who, who really understands the total mind and attitude of God 
But I come to the conclusion in my life that God's ways are always higher than my ways. His thoughts are always higher than my thoughts. And so who am I to question God? Who am I to question God? I will always submit to God even if I don't fully understand something. Because if I have a heart to submit to God, even if I don't fully understand it, he will eventually reveal it to me. But if I say, oh, I don't understand that. I don't know why we would have to do that. Why would you, why would you, why would that? God says, okay. I guess that's where you're going to live. You got to learn to trust me. You have to learn to be God-centered. What was God about to do when he came to Noah and asked him to build the ark? God, it was God about ready to do something, wasn't he? He was about ready to destroy the world, but he got man involved in the process and became dependent upon man. What was God about to do when he came to Abraham and spoke to him about Sodom and Gomorrah? He was about ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, it wasn't about Abraham. It was about what God was about to do. What was God about to do when he came to Gideon? Gideon had no idea what he was going to do. He didn't even know God at the time, I believe. He was worshiping idols. And God came to him, initiated it. God was about ready to deliver Israelites from the oppression of the Midianites. What was God about to do when he came to Saul, who later became Paul? He was about ready to bring the Gentiles into the church. And so in every one of these situations, at each of these moments, the most important factor in each situation was what was God about to do, not what the individual wanted to do for God. 2 Timothy verse 1, chapter 1, 9, probably the most important scripture in this whole message. I almost forgot it. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purposes. You see, God didn't save you just to get you to heaven. He didn't. He saved you to be involved in his purposes. And that's how we honor him, is by giving our lives to his purposes. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And so what is God about to do in your marriage? What is God about to do with your children? What is God about to do with your family life, with the people you work with, your business, your church, your ministry? What is God about to do? Don't you think you should know? One of the greatest revelations I had was when I was a young Bible school student. I went to our career counselor and I says, I have no idea what God wants to do with my life. You know what he said to me? He said, it's not in God's best interest to keep that a secret from you. <laughs> that changed the way I thought about God and the way I thought about the future. I embrace the fact that God delights in giving me revelation and understanding in who I am and what my purpose on earth is. And as, as, I, as I began to embrace that, that that was a given according to God, Lo and behold, <laughs> it began to happen. It began to shape my life. And it will shape your life when you begin to think, in my marriage, what is God about to do? Begin to ask him, what do you want to do in my marriage? What do you want to do with my children? What do you want to do with the people I work with? How are you working in their lives? Bring me alongside. Let me partner with you. And as you partner with him, he begins to speak secrets in your ear. He begins to tell you things. He'll even tell you things about people. And you'll have the wisdom of God, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom to open the hearts of the people that are in your life. That's the way God works. And so are you in sync? And I'm winding up here. Are you in sync with his purposes? in all of these areas, I challenge you, look at what area you're not in sync with. What is God about to do in your harvest field? Will you be ready to respond to his initiative as Abraham, 
Joseph and many others have done through the annals of time? Or will you be too focused on self to discern what it is he wants to do? John 4.35, do you not say, there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They're already white for harvest. The work is already being done by him, by the Holy Spirit. It's time for you to get engaged in the process. When we are truly living God-centered lives rather than self-centered lives, we find ourselves in the right position to be used by God for his kingdom purposes. God has purposes all around you in your field of labor. All you have to do is look up at the field. Look out and see where God is working. And so will you choose to be in sync with God's purposes and plans, or will you fritter your life away being focused on self? The choice is yours. Amen? It's your choice. I can't do it for you. Nobody can do it for you. It's a choice you must make. I'm going to go ahead and pray for each and every one of you, and then Homer's going to come, or somebody's going to come. Father, I just thank you today for these men, Lord. I thank you for this word, God, that you gave me in the middle of the night in a dream. You showed me the whole message. God, I thank you for this word. I pray that this word will shape what you are doing in building in each one of these men's lives, Lord. That you would touch them, Lord, in that area that seems to short circuit the most. What is that area that short circuits the most? Touch them there, Lord, and cause them to embrace what you desire to do and not what self desires. We give you all the glory, all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.